Really? Yeah. There was an acid brass performance? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. It was in the bomb. Such good music. Yeah. And, but that came out of a thinking that was relating the history of raves in the 1980s in Britain to the deindustrialization of Britain, and particularly the end of the coal mining strikes and the ends of unions under Thatcher. So this was not a kind of casual uh, association that you came to. It's again, it's the idea of music being linked to history and being, you can't separate them really. They're both very tightly connected. And sometimes they're, they're even closer than you might think. So it was really about a his, uh, as a, that piece was about a musical history of Britain in a hundred, in a hundred years of change in music, but also in politics and technology and culture, really, society. Actually, there's a question on the wall about this, which is asking why museums should take music in part of their exhibition program. Oh, yes, why museums should? Well, why yeah. museums oh, well, should? As opposed to why shouldn't they? Is it yeah. like, why should, why should museums do it? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, I think, well, museums, you don't necessarily have to take music, but you can take art about music, maybe. Yeah. Maybe that would be something. I think, you know, with this new show at, at um, Museum of Modern Art, they've slightly overstretched themselves by the sounds of it, this Bjork show, where they've actually it's a very good subject for an exhibition, but maybe it hasn't been done in the, in the way it could have been done. But um, there's just different approaches. So I think it could, it, well, it does exist. So yes, that's, I think it's a good thing to, for it to happen. But it's funny because no one will complain if an art museum puts on an architecture show. Mm. And yet for contemporary artists, pop music is, for the most part, much more important and influential than architecture. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's not like... Um... Well, it's a slightly more democratic sort of art form. Um, but, um, yes, architecture shows are quite, can be quite odd as well, though, can't they? But that's another, mm. that's another question. But maybe it's this idea of music, because it's funny that, I was thinking about this earlier today, that you have cinema studies courses at universities around the world. People can get master's degrees in cinema studies. But I don't know of any course at any university that's about pop music, where you could actually get a degree in pop music, and it seems like that culture is just as important as, as film. I think there's probably popular, there's studies in sort of popular culture and pop, so they probably do exist. Yeah. If you want I've to take my one. degree in yeah. Depeche Mode. We have another question here. Okay. Yeah, you said uh, you are interested in going into museums and shops to see people. Uh, museums and shops are interesting in the, in the sense that you can go and see. You can wear a mask. You don't have to confront people. The same with rock uh, concert. You can go and enjoy, but you don't have to reveal yourself. Uh, you said that you don't like people. Could I in interpret this that I'd you don't want to take off your mask? To me, personally? You, yeah, you want to stay, uh, so to say, hidden. Maybe, yes. While you uh, visit these civil civility, be civility places. What, what was that last, what places? Civ places of civility. Of oh, civility. Why do I, okay, I'll, I'll just, I, I think I get the sort of the, the, the rough uh, gist of it. I'm not, it, people annoy me, obviously. I don't say I hate people, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go quite that far. That would be a bit disturbing to say that. But people can be annoying um, in public, the way, way, they, be, way they behave. But um, I've never, I've always been one for observing rather than taking part, which is weird, because a lot of my work is about taking part. I have a sort of dread of it, so in a way I try and uh, make work about it to cure myself of my re reluctance to take part and like in sports, even as a child I wasn't very good at taking part. So it's, it's, it's an attempt, projects like this are kind of self-help in a way. But um, I don't think I, I'm answering that last part of your question necessarily. We can talk about it afterwards, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what the last part was actually. 
Uh, do we have more questions, or should we scroll down the message board? Is there any questions? I'm a bit worried about Ralph's got to get a plane at 7 o'clock. No, no, I think so. Yeah? There's one, question, uh, there's one question here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering a bit more about your relationship to making history real again, or to this kind of uh, reenacting re of history, or mm. what do you think the value is of, of putting people like in a mining strike, or putting people, you know, to touch objects, or yeah. Um, it's, uh, well, when I reenacted a battle from the miners' strike, this is a piece of work of mine where I reenacted a, a big confrontation between police and striking miners with a, a thousand people using original people that had been there, but other people from historical societies. Um, I did that because I just felt it's, it was something that needed looking at again, and, and it was a good way of jogging people's memories. So it's like reenacting a crime scene. When the police in Britain, uh, often when there's very violent or very unusual crimes are committed, like children are abducted or whatever, the police will recreate the scene. Not the crime itself, but like what leads up to it. Um, to jog people's memories. And so I was trying to do that um, with that piece. With this piece, it's different. It's just, it was really about holding something and uh, trying to get into the mind of the person that made it or used it by holding it. That's one idea. So it's a, it's a sort of piece of time travel, maybe. What do you see the, the, like, the value of doing that for? Sorry, please. Use what is the value of doing it yeah, like, for me? What, what do you see, yeah, the value of doing so, stuff like that for, for making histories kind of... We're changing the way I people think, experience history. I think you've just answered your question. It's, the, it's just changing. It's changing something. Yeah. Yeah, we have question. Uh, one more question. Yes, I, I actually started to think that you have not talked at all about your uh, kind of work as a curator. And here on Friday, we had a discussion on uh, artists as curators. And now I started, I, re, I, I think you uh, said on Friday that you actually want to keep separate your work as a curator and your work as an artist. And now I started to wonder that, <clears throat> could you maybe, uh, am I right? And if I am right, so could you uh, tell us or try to uh, yeah, explain what is the... I, Where is the border? I mean, because I was, from my eyes, they, they is, I, I mean, I have difficulties to, to know whether this rock show is your work or is... Have you worked as a curator here? It's not my work. I don't think you can say it's my work. It's an idea, but it's not a piece of work at all. Some artists would claim it as an artwork and would just do endless tours of it, I suspect. But I, it will probably happen again, but it's not an artwork. And, in a way, the, the objects that I've selected to go in the shopping centers and other places, that's a, that's a form of curation, isn't it? That's a selection of objects. It's more selection than curation. Well, actually, there's a bit of curation involved. But yes, but I, what I'm trying to say is that when I do an exhibition, a traditional, what I would call traditional exhibition, uh, like the William Morris and Andy Warhol one, I, I'm not claiming it as an artwork in its own right. It's just an exhibition. We have a few more minutes if there is still any questions. Um, hello, my name is Paula Toppila. I'm the executive director of this festival. I could t take the answer that Susanna was, or answer to the question that you posed about the future of this project, what happens, oh, yes. because uh, it's not a continuation of the project, but it's a continuation of the process always for us that afterwards we have feedback meetings and uh, for example now that we have collaborated with seven historical museums um, we will meet with them and together with the stewards the 15 people who met all the 5,500 people during one week because we really want to share that experience with the museum so that they in if they want and I think they are very willing to to um, develop their audience work how do they work in museums and how do they expose the, the object to their audiences and if they can find new forms for that. So that's a very important question actually and it's very 
important that we pass on this knowledge that we were gathering during the project. But it's another thing, it's not, it's something that was born along the way, but it's, it's not a continuation of your work as an artist. Thank you. Would you like to add something else before we finish? Just one more question at this time. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, uh, I just wanted to add to what was asked uh, uh, or what Jeremy answered just, uh, just uh, shortly because uh, when I interviewed you, yeah. Jeremy, I asked you uh, whether you would have coffee with uh, Damien Hurst <laughs> and you quite firmly answered no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was... Uh, um, I thought it was a kind of definition of, because you were talking about that you don't think of these things that you've done as artworks exactly, that you collect things around. Um, and we know very well that uh, Damien has not done his works uh, himself for years and years. So that uh, sort of brings up the question, uh, how do you, define the role of an artist, really. Um, right. Not more than that. <laughs> I Thank thought you. I just, I thought I answered that as best as I could, but I just thought, I probably, that idea of having coffee with someone, I mean, it, it just wouldn't, as a situation, it, well, it wouldn't arise, so, and I probably wouldn't enjoy it, which is why I thought I preferred to have coffee with someone else, maybe, who I hadn't met, but uh, that's why. But, like I said, there's different artists, aren't there? There's him, and he, his role is whatever, and mine is something else, but... I suppose communication. You're communicating something. That's like a really weak answer, I'm afraid, but that might be it. Okay, let's have the last question, then. We have to finish. No pressure. I'm not sure that this will arrive at a question. Yeah. <coughs> um, my field is archaeology, and I suppose between archaeology and artists were the twin sources of most of the population of museums. Uh, and one of the most frustrating things about my field is, is that we, we spend a lot of time excavating things, but uh, the saying is that we can't excavate experiences. You can't dig up a smell, hopefully, uh, or you can't dig up a, a sound. And so we have to fill all of that in, but the process of filling all that in is experiential. It's, um, it's a step beyond the scientific. You have to tell a story, uh, regardless of how well it's founded <clears throat> in, in facts. And I suppose rather than a question, I'd like to make just a remark that this is what I find valuable about this interaction of uh, especially community-based art uh, and the populations of museums. This is that it brings this experiential storytelling element back into these dead objects. We try to restore some of the life of these things that, that really lose so much when they're neutered and taken out of the ground and, and put in the glass cases. And there's one thing before we finish. I, I think you're totally right because holding is a sense, isn't it? That's one of the things and it's very important and you can make that connection. Right. And what I think is quite funny is that if you think about some of those axe heads, some of, some of the objects were discard, might have been discarded like an axe head. Not some of them, obviously ceremonial. And if the person that made that object 5,000, 10,000 years ago knew that 10,000 years in the future, people would be looking at these things and marveling over them, something he threw out or whatever, it's actually quite, a f there's, there's, there's humor within that. But um, going back to the idea about stories, that's what we kind of hunger for stories, don't we? And I think because uh, it gives meaning and, uh, to us. And uh, that's a very, very ancient need as well. But, that's hopefully through holding something, you make that very quick connection with, a, with someone, someone else. Yes, and I think the project has done very well, so. Well, thank you. Rather than make another comment, I'll just thank you and. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jeremy, thank you, Rolf, and thank you, the audience. And uh, now we'll have a short 30 minute break here. Feel free to go and see the piece, it's still...
there for a half an hour. Eli nyt meillä on pieni puolen tunnin break, me jatketaan tässä kuuelta. Käykää ihmeessä katsomassa vielä tätä teosta, saa koskea. Katsomassa, koskettamassa ja kuulemassa tarinoita. Ja nähdään täällä hetken päästä, eli kello 18 jatkuu ihme maratonilla. So at six o'clock we continue with the ihme marathon. <laughs>